I want to begin by reading from God's Word tonight. So if you have a Bible with you, would you like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve and after that to more than five hundred brothers at the same time most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. (coughs) 
Since I'm 80, this could be my last visit to South Africa. And this could be the last time I speak in South Africa. So I have carefully chosen my subject. Because people tend to remember your last word. And so I've chosen the subject of the resurrection. In the year 1054, there was the biggest split in the church that had ever been seen. And all the eastern churches, in, based in Constantinople as their headquarters, split from the western churches in Rome. And from that day, they have remained apart, and still are. And the result is they have developed differently. And one of the main differences that has developed between them is that we in the Western churches have focused our faith on the crucifixion, on the death of Christ. And this shows in so many churches where the cross is the symbol of our faith. In the Catholic churches of the West, the cross usually has the body of Christ on it. But in the Protestant churches of the West, there is an empty cross but it's still the cross. Whereas in the Eastern Orthodox churches, all over Greece and Russia and other countries, the risen Jesus is the center of their faith. The resurrection is the focus of it. And so much so that even in the streets on Easter Sunday, Russians greet each other by saying, Christ is risen and getting the response, he is risen indeed. And that's the normal greeting in the street on Easter Sunday, in the Eastern churches. And I have to confess before you that my heart is with the Eastern churches on this. The center of my faith is not the cross, but the resurrection. As I just read to you, if Christ has not been raised, the cross can do nothing for you. You are still in your sins, says Paul. And that's why Jesus died, so that your sins might be taken away. But they're not taken away if crucifixion was not followed by the resurrection. Do you realize that every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection, Amen. not the crucifixion? We worship on a Sunday because that's the day, not when he died, but the day on which he rose from the dead. It should be the very center of our faith also. And every Sunday we are commemorating a unique event. A Jewish man who lived 2,000 years ago, executed as a dangerous criminal at the age of 33, buried for three days and three nights, yet back with his friends on the fourth day, actually eating supper with them. He stayed around for six weeks, then he disappeared and not ha has not been seen since. And millions around the world believe that he is still alive and that he is coming back and will appear again on planet Earth among us. That's what we celebrate every Sunday. But is it true? Did it really happen? Christianity does not depend on the cross, it depends on the resurrection. If that did not happen, we have a worldwide religion that is based on fraud, based on a lie, and that would be a terrible thing. If it didn't happen, it's the biggest fraud in history. 1,500 million people have been fooled and believe something that is not true. We should be closing the churches, not opening them. We should let Christianity die a natural death. If Christ was not raised, we are living in false comfort and delusion if Christ was not raised. Now many would be happy to see the church go because they believe that Jesus was a great teacher in his day. They accept his teaching as the finest that was ever given. 
Indians like Mahatma Gandhi and Russians like Dostoevsky say the Sermon on the Mount is the finest moral teaching that mankind has ever received. And even though that neither of them became Christian, they believed that if only we would all live by Jesus' teaching, the world would be a wonderful, happy, healthy place in which to live. The only problem is nobody's yet been able to live the Sermon on the Mount. Its standards are so high, very much higher than the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. The Old Commandments said you mustn't go to bed with a woman. Jesus said you mustn't think about it. The Old Commandments said you mustn't murder anyone. Jesus said you mustn't even wish them dead. And you must never call anybody a fool. You must never look down with contempt on anyone. Or you are a murderer in principle. So Jesus' moral teaching was far stricter than the Jewish moral code. So many would be happy for the church to close down. But we couldn't do that if we believe that Christ was raised from the dead. Now without the resurrection, we could not believe in Jesus. We would have to say he can't be trusted because he promised to come back on the third day. And if he didn't keep that promise, no one can trust Jesus. He was either self-deceived or a liar. He was either a lunatic, a liar or the Lord. He was either mad, bad or God. You've got to choose. Those are the only three possibilities. And the one that has convinced us that he is not a liar and not a lunatic, but the Lord, and even my God, my Lord, as Thomas said to him, is the resurrection. The cross would never have led to the Christian faith if Jesus died for us but didn't come back to life again. It's as important as that. And he died appealing to a higher court, a, a human court condemned him to death, believing that he was too bad to live, that he was a dangerous man, and that a whole nation would be destroyed if they allowed him to go on living and teaching what he did. Uh, but he died appealing to God to reverse the verdict of the human court and three days later God did just that and reversed the verdict. So Christianity hangs or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the pivot of our whole faith and that's why Paul wrote the words I've just read to you. If Christ was not raised from the dead then we are of all people most to be pitied we have pinned our faith on someone who was telling lies. And that would be a very serious thing. So I love to preach on the resurrection. And I want to just clear some false ideas away before we build our faith together. First of all, it was not a resuscitation. We are now used to people being resuscitated after they are clinically dead. We have machines that will bring the heart back to life. We have other machines to pump air into lungs. And we now have the capability of bringing someone back to life who has just died. But every time we do that, that's a resuscitation. It is not conquering death. It is postponing death. And they all die again later. Jesus rose not to die again, and he has not died since. That's the difference from a resuscitation. Nor is it a reincarnation. From one point of view it is, but not from the point of view of the widespread belief that we all come back as someone else. That's the heart of re reincarnation, that you do come back to life, but you come back as someone else and you might not even remember who you were in the previous life and you might come back as an animal 
and a duck could be somebody's mother, as the old song goes. Jesus came back as himself, and there is no ground in Jesus' resurrection for the popular view of reincarnation. So we're talking about something that has never happened to anyone else in the whole of history. Jesus' resurrection was unique. He did not come back to life. He went on to a new life with a new body, which he still has 2,000 years later and which one day you will see when he gets back to earth. Now, I want to look tonight at six aspects of the resurrection, all of which are the Christians' concern. I want to look first at the sequence of events. What really happened and when did it happen? I want to look second after that at the evidence for the resurrection. What evidence can we offer to the world to convince them that Jesus did rise from the dead? I will look thirdly at the significance of the re resurrection. What did it mean? What, what are we intended to understand by the event? Then we shall look at the essence of the resurrection. What actually did God do when he raised Jesus from the dead? Then fifthly, I want to look at the experience of the resurrection that we can have in our own experience. I rem remember one man being asked, how do you know Jesus is alive? And he just said, well, I was talking to him only this morning. Which is not a bad answer, but it's pointing to an experience that we can have of the resurrection. And then finally, I want to look at the consequence of the resurrection for each one of us and for the world in which we live. So there's my six-point sermon. I was told to have only three points when I began preaching. But uh, I'm ignoring that. I'm giving you a double dose tonight. <laughs> first, let's look at the sequence. And the first thing I must tell you, which may have puzzled you as you read your Bible, that if Jesus died on a Friday afternoon and rose on a Sunday morning, he was quite wrong to, when he said, I will be three days and three nights in the tomb. You cannot fit three days and three nights between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. It's an impossibility. How many of you have noticed that apparent anomaly? Could I see? So you have noticed. And have you really wondered how you can fit it all in? And then, in other places, Jesus said he would arise on the third day. And that won't fit either because even Friday to Sunday morning is just two days. So how do we fit it all together? And I want to tell you first that Jesus did not die on a Friday. That's the first thing that surprises Christians. The Bible never said that he died on a Friday afternoon. Why then have we such a strong tradition in the church that he died on a Friday? So much so that many Christians won't eat meat on a Friday but only fish because they're quite sure that's the day he died. Well, they do it because it says that the body had to be taken down from the cross quickly before the Sabbath began. And as you probably know, Jewish days begin at 6 p.m. at sunset and then go through to the next day at sunset. They don't go from midnight to midnight. That's the Roman way of counting days, and we follow the Roman way. We don't follow the Jewish way. But the Jews to this day begin their Sabbath at 6 p.m. on Friday evening. Therefore, people said he must have died on Friday evening because the Sabbath was beginning at 6 o'clock in the evening and he was dead at three, and they had to hurry the burial. But they haven't read their Bibles properly. 
John's Gospel tells us quite definitely it was not the weekly Sabbath, but it was a special Sabbath, a special day of rest. And we know that the Passover feast at which Jesus died began with a Sabbath day, which could have been any day of the week. So he did not die on a Friday. So what day did he die on? Everything points to him dying on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock. And in the year that he died, the date on which he died was on a Wednesday. And so if he died on a Wednesday afternoon, he was three days and three nights in the tomb. But what was this about rising on the third day? The answer is that they followed both the Roman way of counting days from midnight to midnight and the Hebrew way of counting from sunset to sunset, 6 p.m. Now, if he rose again on Saturday evening between 6 p.m. and midnight, then everything fits. And every reference fits perfectly. That would mean he was three days and three nights in the tomb. But it would also mean that he rose on the third day, counting it Roman-wise. But you say, if he rose between 6 p.m. and midnight on the Saturday, that's not the first day of the week. Oh, yes, it is. It's the first day of the week, Jewish reckoning. And we know that the tomb was empty long before the sun rose on Sunday morning. I don't know where we got the idea that he rose on Sunday morning at 10.30, just in time for the morning service. <laughs> but in fact, I'm just putting to you a solution to all the problems in Scripture that gives a sequence of being buried on Wednesday evening before 6 p.m., and of rising between 6 p.m. and midnight on Saturday. And when the women came to the tomb early on Sunday, before the sun was up, the tomb was already empty. He'd gone. And so that's a sequence that fits the scripture. And I just present it to you uh, to enlighten you on the sequence. And you can study your Bible for yourself. It doesn't really matter what day he died on, but it does matter what day he rose on. And it must be the first day of the week or the eighth day of the week, the beginning of a new week. It had to be on that day because it was on that day that God first created the heavens and the earth, and began the whole work of creation. And what I'm going to show you later this evening is that the resurrection of Jesus meant that God had gone back to work and had started his work of recreation of the entire universe. But we'll say more about that later. Unless you see that the resurrection of Jesus was the beginning of the new creation, you will not understand what it was all about. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But the sequence I've described means where was Jesus between his crucifixion and his resurrection? Where was he for three days and three nights? And once again, the Bible gives us the answer. But most Christians don't even know. Because we have Holy Week services from Sunday to Friday, and we give it a rest on Saturday and pick it up again on Sunday. So very few people even think about where he was during those three days and nights. His body was in the tomb, but he wasn't. He was somewhere else. And it's Peter who has told us where he was and what he was doing during those three days and three nights. In fact, he was preaching. And he was preaching to a very unusual congregation, to everybody who had been drowned in Noah's flood. 
Isn't that an extraordinary piece of information? But it's in your Bible. Did you find it in Peter's first letter? Because the risen Lord appeared to Peter, we don't know where, we don't know when, we don't know what was said. But I can imagine Peter saying, Jesus, where on earth have you been? And Jesus said, I haven't been on earth. Well, have you been in heaven? No, I haven't been in heaven. Have you been in hell? No. Where on earth have you been? I've been in Hades, Sheol, the world of the departed spirits. And I've been preaching the gospel to the people who were drowned in Noah's flood. And we do have that piece of information, unusual though it is, in Peter's letter. The first letter of Peter, chapter 3, if you're interested. And it's all there. That Jesus was able to preach to other spirits who had died long ago. And they were able to listen to him. Which means that when we die and lose our body, we are fully conscious we are able to communicate with the dead, but we're not able to communicate with the living. Because we need a body for that. And Jesus was without a body for those few days. But he could preach, he could communicate, and people could listen, and they did. It's a remarkable insight into what was happening while his body was buried. The resurrection was nothing else than his spirit being reunited with a body. But as we shall see, it was not the old body which had disappeared. It was a new body, a new creation of God. And that new body didn't get any older. Had he been brought back into his old body, he would have died again later. He would have got older and older and then died. But he was given a brand new body that would last forever. And he's the only person in the whole of history who's had that happen to him. Nobody else has. We all leave our bodies behind to go back to the dust of the earth, whether quickly in cremation or slowly in burial. This body is made up, every atom of it is made up of chemicals in the earth and will go back to the earth and be lost in the earth. But the spirit goes on. But the spirit is without a body and therefore cannot communicate with anyone in this world. When my daughter died at 36, we had to say goodbye to her. She couldn't communicate with us again and hasn't since. But I know that she's very much alive. I know who she's with. She knows who she's with. She is fully conscious. And I rejoice for her, but I look forward to the, the day when she comes back to earth and gets a new body. And I'll get a new body at the same time. And we'll be able to communicate again on earth as we did when we had a body. So Jesus was out of touch with everybody on earth. He could no longer preach to the living but he could preach to the dead, and he did so. And he singled out, especially those who'd been drowned in Noah's flood. Now I've given you the sequence of events, as I believe they really happened. And I think I've told you some things that you never thought about. But perhaps you did. But let's move on from the sequence of events to what I've called the evidence for his resurrection. Can we make a good case to a skeptical world? Can we prove to them the resurrection? If not, we're going to have difficulties with people. We must be ready to give some reason for believing that he rose from the dead. And we can produce evidence for that, and should. And the Bible gives us that evidence. We cannot produce the body. But that cuts both ways. Unbelievers have never been able to produce the dead body of Jesus and believers have never been able to produce the live body. And so we're at a handicap there. There is no physical evidence that we can produce. 
We could have produced the empty tomb if we knew where it was and which it was, but we can't even do that. We have no physical evidence, but that's not the only kind of evidence. We have no scientific evidence to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Science needs one of two kinds of evidence, either observation or experiment. And science either observes an event and measures it with the appropriate instrument and says it happened, or if they are able to reproduce the event in the laboratory, then they can prove that a thing happened. But they can't do either with the resurrection of Jesus. No scientist was there, and there were no instruments to measure anything. It was done in darkness in a tomb. It was not done in observation. And so, neither by observation nor experiment can science prove the resurrection. Because science has never been able to give a person a new immortal body. Science has enabled us to resuscitate people. A friend of mine was ten days dead in the Stanford University Medical Center. It's the longest known case of someone being clinically dead and being brought back to life. He's a dear friend of mine. He was a pastor, not a very good one. And uh, he developed a tumor in the base of his spine. And the doctors were extremely reluctant to give him surgery in case they paralyzed him. But the pain got worse and worse. He was found in a wheelchair after a bit and he became a registered drug addict through the drugs he was taking to kill the pain. One night he was so depressed and fed up, he got out of bed, got into his wheelchair and wheeled himself into the bathroom. He was an American, he had a gun, most Americans seem to, so he took the gun with him into the bathroom, put it to his head and pulled the trigger. And it had a bullet in every hole in the chamber except one. And the trigger fell on that one. And that brought him to his senses and he wheeled himself back to the bedroom and told his wife what he'd done. And she said, you might as well have the operation. Might as well die on the operating theater table as die by your own hand in the bathroom. And so he went into hospital. Before he went in, he opened his Bible and it fell open at a verse in the Psalms that said, I go to sleep and I wake again, for the Lord is with me. And he wrote that on a slip of paper and slipped it into his Bible, which he took into the hospital. They wheeled him into the operating theater and the anesthetist injected his spine with anesthetic, put too much in, and he died. And his heart stopped. They immediately tried to resuscitate him. Uh, in fact, a surgeon was pounding his chest. Indeed, he jumped up on top of him and was using his knees on his lungs to try and get him breathing again. They gave shock treatment to get the heart going again but nothing happened. So the surgeon went out to his wife who was in the waiting room and said, we're very sorry, but we've lost him. And she said, no, you haven't. And go back in and try again. So they went back in. And uh, the surgeon was kneeling on him, pummeling his chest. And the next patient for surgery was wheeled into the ante room on a trolley a gurney, saw the surgeon through the door <laughs> jumping on the patient and said, you're not going to do that to me, jumped off the trolley and ran round the operating theatre naked, chased by a nurse. <laughs> but they couldn't bring Tom, for his name was Tom, Tom Scorinci, they couldn't bring him back to life. And so they, having tried another 40 minutes, they went out and told his wife, he's dead. His brain has been without oxygen for far too long. He's clinically dead. 
She said, no, he isn't. Try again. Now, she's a little, little lady, but boy, she packs a punch and she told them, go back in and try again. So they went back in. And they got his heart going again with uh, electrical impulses. They pushed a tube down his throat and got his lungs working again. And then they watched the screen for his brain scan. But the line was dead level. There wasn't a movement in his brain. And so they went out again to his wife and said, I'm sorry, he's really dead. His brain is dead. He's clinically dead. We can sign a death certificate. We've got his heart and lungs going, but on machines, and it's purely a mechanical form of life. It's not life. And she said, keep him on the machines. And they wheeled him back to the room with the heart machine and the lung machine and got him back into bed. And she kept visiting him and came every day. And still there was no brain movement whatsoever, no brain waves. And so finally, without her permission, they took him off the machines and took his body away because he promised them they could have his organs for transplants. And she came in to visit him and the bed is empty. And boy, she then blew her top and she said, where's my husband? <laughs> well, he did promise that we could have his organs and the machines have kept the organs healthy so we've taken him away. She said, bring him back. And they found him somewhere and brought him back and put him back in his bed, at which point he opened his eyes. And he saw his Bible lying on the floor, and this piece of paper had fallen out of it. I go to sleep, and I wake up, because the Lord is with me. And they couldn't believe it. So they took the tube out of his throat, and he could talk. And they took the heart, pump off and his heart was working. Ten days with a dead brain. The surgeon came and sat on his bed and said, Mr. Skarinsky, do you know how long you've been unconscious? Well, he said, I know it's a big operation. <laughs> and he said, I guess it's a number of hours. And the surgeon said, it's not, it's ten days. And he said, well, anyway, I feel no pain, so the operation's been a success. <laughs> but they hadn't operated. They finally left him alone, resting, and he decided to get up and take a walk and to test his back to see if it was all right. And his arm was still being fed with glucose from a bo bottle, so he picked the bottle off the stand and went for a walk down the main ward in Stanford Medical Center. And a nurse saw him and she shrieked, the miracle man is walking! <laughs> and they got him back to bed and said, you must not walk, you've been, you've been very ill. But he just got better and better. And finally he walked out of the hospital while all the staff lined the passageway and cheered the miracle man. He's still alive, is Tom, but he'll die. He didn't conquer death, he only postponed it. Jesus conquered death, and so is still alive 2,000 years later. That's the big difference. Now then, what proof have we? Well, we have legal proof, and legal proof will convince any jury in the world. You see, every day, juries have to decide whether something happened. And they were not there at the time, so they have to study the evidence. And on good evidence, they can decide beyond reasonable doubt that something has happened. Now, there are two kinds of legal evidence that are considered evidence to prove an event has happened that nobody present witnessed. One is eyewitness testimony. That's the best evidence. Something happened that other people saw happen. And if you can get eyewitness testimony, 
that's almost sufficient of itself. But there's an interesting feature in eyewitness testimony. They never quite agree. There are discrepancies because no two people see the same event identically. Let's suppose that somebody's been in a car accident and it's led to the death of someone and a witness will say, I saw a dog run across the road in front of the car and that caused the car to swerve. Another witness will say, there were two dogs, one was chasing each other. Another will say there were children running after the dogs and that caused the car to swerve. When we have eyewitness testimony, you expect such slight discrepancies. If eyewitness testimony agrees in every detail, you know they've cooked up the story. It's a fact of life that humans don't see things exactly the same way. They can describe the same accident in different terms. One can say the car was blue. Another can say the car was green. Actually, it was probably turquoise. And some sort is blue and some sort is green because even our color sight can vary from one person to another. So eyewitness testimony is very impressive when they don't quite agree. Are you with me? Because you know they have seen for themselves. If eyewitness testimony agrees in every detail, you know they've cooked up a story and agreed what to say. When we read the Gospels, we've got eyewitness testimony. And the interesting thing is, they don't agree in every little detail. They're exactly what you expect genuine eyewitness testimony to say. For example, one Gospel said there was one angel at the tomb. Another Gospel says there were two angels at the tomb, one at the head and one at the foot of where the body had been. One saw one angel, one saw two angels. Who's telling the truth? They both are telling the truth. One only saw one and the other saw two. But they were independent eyewitnesses. If the four Gospels agreed on every detail on the resurrection, you'd know they cooked up a story between them but they have that slight discrepancy that you always get with genuine eyewitness testimony. And that tells you that in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we've got independent eyewitnesses who saw the event for themselves. That's very impressive. The other kind of evidence that a law court considers, especially if the eyewitness testimony is absent, is what's called circumstantial evidence. Let me try and illustrate that. A woman's body has been found at the foot of a cliff at the seaside. And the suspicion is that she was killed by her husband. But nobody saw him kill her. There were no eyewitnesses. So you can't have eyewitness testimony. In that case, you rely on circumstantial evidence. First, they discover that a week before she, her body was found, he'd taken out life insurance on her and was going to benefit to a million rand. That's circumstantial evidence. Doesn't prove it yet. Then you discovered that he had booked a flight for two for a holiday but he was taken with him his mistress. And then you discovered that he'd arranged for a church where they were going on a holiday to conduct their marriage. Then you discover letters between him and his mistress discussing what to do with the wife. And so the circumstantial evidence builds up, not one of which proves it, but added together cumulative evidence points in one direction. And then they do find an eyewitness who saw them both walking towards the cliff. And another eyewitness saw him coming back alone. Still no one has actually seen the murder take place. 
But when you bring all this evidence together, a reasonable jury would say beyond reasonable doubt this man killed his wife and must pay the penalty. Now the circumstantial, we've got eyewitness evidence in the Gospels and it's, it's very impressive. Add to that the circumstantial evidence of things that have happened around that event and you begin to get a strong case. For example, no leaks of a conspiracy have ever been found. There have been plenty of theories of conspiracy, but no evidence for a conspiracy to steal the body or hide it somewhere else. And people have examined this event more than any other event in history, perhaps, and they've never found evidence of a conspiracy. Then there is the fact of the changed disciples. They're behind locked doors. They're, they're in fear of their lives. And within weeks, they're preaching and accusing the Jews of killing Jesus in the open, in front of crowds. And they're arrested for it. Now what, what has happened to change those disciples from being so scared they ran away to actually getting up in public and accusing those who were responsible for the Lord's death. Something extraordinary must have happened. Then there is the fact that Jews changed their day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. And the early church, which was entirely Jewish, worshipped on a Sunday. Have you ever tried to persuade somebody to change the day of worship in their religion? Have you ever tried to make a Muslim change from Friday? Or a Jew from Saturday? Or a Christian from Sunday? I once did tease our congregation at home by announcing one Sunday that from next week onwards we'll worship on a Monday. <laughs> and because most of you go to work, we'll worship at six in the morning and ten at night, as the early Christians did. And they all took me very seriously. They thought the elders had really decided that. And I saw them talking to each other. How will we manage that? But that's what happened to the Jews. They had a Sabbath day every Saturday when they worshipped. And yet, the, here are a bunch of Jews who switched to a working day. And are having to meet before they go to work and after they come home. What could have persuaded them to do that. I could go on to the evidence of thousands of people whose lives have been totally changed when they talk to Jesus. And you don't talk to dead people. Just by talking to Jesus, their lives have been transformed. I preach in prisons back home. I preach in gypsy encampments. And I've seen their lives transformed. Sinners made into saints just by talking to Jesus. And I've told them, you talk to him and find out if he's alive because he'll talk back and he'll change your life. That's circumstantial evidence and it all adds up. Now therefore we have very strong legal evidence and indeed judges have said this I'm quoting here the Lord High Chancellor of England who said this no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true and that's because lawyers judges understand evidence they have to decide every day whether something happened that they did not witness. And they collect eyewitness testimony and circumstantial evidence to prove the case. There were two professors of law in Oxford University. I have their names. One was a lord, Lord Littleton, and the other was Gilbert West. And they were atheists. They were anti-Christianity. And they decided one summer vacation to spend the whole summer looking at the evidence for the resurrection, to pick holes in it, to
to prove that Jesus didn't rise. They decided to do it separately and then come together at the beginning of the autumn term and write a book to prove that Jesus didn't rise. When the two men met in October at the beginning of the term, one of them said to the other, I'm afraid I can't write that book with you. I've looked at the evidence and I'm convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. And the other one said, you don't know how relieved I am that you said that because I've come to that conclusion too. When lawyers examine the evidence, it convinces them. And more lawyers have become Christians than any other profession because they understand evidence. I don't know if you've ever heard of a book by a lawyer called Frank Morrison who wrote a book entitled Who Moved the Stone? And the first chapter is entitled The Book That Refused to Be Written. And he too set out to look at the evidence and tear it apart to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But the more he looked at the evidence, the more that lawyer was convinced. And he wrote the book with the first chapter <coughs> entitled The Book That Refused to Be Written. And the rest of the book is all about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. It's enough to convince anybody who's willing to examine the evidence with an unbiased, open mind. The problem we run into is that people don't want to examine the evidence. Why not? Because if Jesus rose from the dead, they will have to change their lives. It's as simple as that. People don't want to look at the evidence. They don't want us to prove that Jesus rose from the dead because they know perfectly well they cannot carry on as they are if Jesus is alive. So I'm turning now from the evidence for the resurrection to the significance of it. What does it mean? Well, the first thing I must say here is that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The New Testament is very, very careful to say God raised him from the dead. It was not an act of Jesus, it was an act of God. And God is the creator. And God was doing something in the darkness of that tomb. He was, first of all, reversing the verdict of the human court. They said he's too bad to live. God said he's too good to rot. And God had said in Psalm 16, way back in the Old Testament, that if anybody ever lived a holy life, God would not let him rot in the grave. This body I'm using to communicate with you will rot. It will stink very quickly. But his body didn't. It was not allowed to. And this is why he was raised on the third day. Because if he'd still been in the tomb on the fourth day, his body would have begun to rot. Lazarus was in the tomb on the fourth day and he was already smelly. But Jesus was rescued from rot. This body will rot because it's been inhabited by a rotten person. And that's the sentence that God has passed. Death of the body on those who have lived a rotten life. The body rots. No reason why it should. There is no scientific reason why your body should die. It is incredibly capable of renewing all its cells every seven years. It's amazing. Why then does the body run down? Why does it get older? Why does your hair get thinner? Why do your teeth get fewer? Why? Well, because God has put a sentence of death on those who don't live right. And that's why my body will rot. But Jesus' body was not allowed to. And when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he quoted that psalm that says, My Holy One, I will not allow to rot in the grave. That's why God raised Jesus before real putrefaction set in. But why didn't God do it earlier? Why didn't he stop the cross? He could have done. 
And indeed Jesus could have stepped off the cross as easily as I talk to you now. He could still the storm, he could, he could do anything. And he could have stepped off that cross and they teased him on the cross when he cried out, Eloi, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you left me? And they said he's calling on God, let God prove to us that he is the son of God, but God didn't do a thing. And let his son die, and let his son be buried for three days and three nights. Why? That's the second reason. Not only was God reversing the verdict on Jesus, but he allowed him to die and be buried because God wanted that to happen. He was accepting the sacrifice of Christ. And therefore when God raised him the dead, from the dead, he was authenticating that Jesus was who he said he was. He was reversing the verdict and saying, he is my son. Which is why Paul begins his letter to the Romans by pointing to the fact that Jesus is declared the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. It not only declared who he was, but it approved what he had done in dying. God wanted his son to die. He planned it. Jesus also planned it. Jesus was master of the whole situation. He decided when to die, where to die, and how to die. But that was God's plan, which Jesus knew and understood, which is why in Gethsemane he said, not my will but yours be done. And God's will was done in the death of Christ. That was necessary. And God didn't step in at that point to reverse the verdict. Or after he was buried, God wanted us to know that Jesus really died he didn't swoon on the cross and recover shortly afterwards. He was dead and buried. And that settled his sacrifice for our sins once and for all. So the resurrection actually authenticates who Jesus was and what he came to do to die. At the age of 33, so soon, so early, that's the significance of the resurrection. God was acting. But in what way did he act? The essence of the resurrection is that it was an act of creation by the creator. It was from nothing. God makes nothing into something. Only he can do that. We can only manufacture. We can make one material into another material. And when scientists talk of creating life, they have manufactured it. They haven't created it from nothing. No scientist has stood at a laboratory bench and said, let there be life, and there's life. They've always been manipulating chemicals and moving them about and manufacturing life. They don't create life. No scientist can do that. Because all you need to create something out of nothing if you're God is a word. And I know of no scientist who creates anything with a word. But God was creating a new body, a second body, an immortal body, a body that resembled the old body, but was not the old body, a body that had unique qualities of being able to pass through solid bodies locked doors. A new body was created in the tomb. God created the first body for his son in the womb of Mary. He created the second body for his son in the darkness of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The old body simply went to nothing. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, uh, Jesus said, unwrap him and let him free. And they had had to unwrap the bandages. Now when they buried someone in those days, they took a long, long linen roll and they wrapped the body from the feet up to the shoulders. They left the shoulders bare and they took another smaller strip of linen 
and wrapped it round the head like a turban. And so they left the face and the shoulders bare. That's how they buried. And they wrapped essences of uh, chemicals, perfumes, anything that would kill the smell in with the linen folds. Now if Jesus' old body had been resuscitated, then those bandages would have had to be unwrapped to let him out. But they were lying right there, still wound up, but flat. The body had simply gone. And the head turban was in a place by itself. When the Apostle John saw the grave clothes, he knew that God had been busy in that tomb. He knew that no human being could have done that. You can't take a body out of those bandages without unwrapping them. But they were still wrapped up and just flattened. The body had gone. And the new body had been created by God in that tomb. A body that could pass through the stone that had been rolled against the entrance. A new body, an immortal body, a glorious body. Now, if you're not with me in this, if you thought that Jesus was simply brought back into his old body, then may I ask you a question? Where do you think Jesus got his resurrection clothes from? Hands up if you ever thought of that question. Don't you read the Gospels with a, a curious mind? I want to ask why, or everything I read, why? You didn't think he appeared naked in his resurrection, did you? You knew he left the grave clothes in the tomb. So where did he get the clothes from? Every resurrection picture I've seen, Jesus is clothed again. So where did he get his clothes from? Did he uh, go to the shops and buy some? Did he steal some from a washing line? Where did he get his resurrection clothes from? And the answer is, from the same place that he got his new body. From God the Creator. It's the only possible answer. And God gave his son a new body and a new set of clothes out of nothing. That's God, that's the Creator. And uh, Jesus, when he appeared, he appeared first to a group of women. And if he was naked, I think they'd have noticed and done something about it quickly. But they didn't. He was clothed. He had his resurrection clothes. Do you know that you will have clothes in heaven? It's no longer safe to be naked, not since the Garden of Eden. And therefore, you won't need to pack for heaven. There are new clothes waiting for you. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying on my new clothes. God will create them for me when he gives me a new body because he can make something out of nothing it was God who raised Jesus from the dead and he did it on the first day of the week which is in Jewish timing Saturday evening six o'clock onwards and the first day of the week was the beginning of the old creation it's also the beginning of the new creation that's why we worship God on a Sunday. It is not a Sabbath. It's not a day of rest. For many Christians, it becomes the busiest day of the week. But we celebrate Sunday because that's the day that God went back to work. The Jews still worship God on a Saturday because that's the day when he rested from his work of old creation. But we are celebrating that God is back at work. He's employed again. The seventh day of God's rest lasted all the way through the Old Testament. And the Old Testament itself says he created nothing new. Indeed, the book of Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. And that was true all through the Old Testament. And now... On the first Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, God has started his work of creation again. Only he's going to create a whole new universe. 
That's why the early Christians called Sunday the eighth day. It's the first day of the second week of creation. And God is recreating everything. But this time he's doing it all in reverse order. In the old creation, God made the heavens and the earth first, and men and women last. But in the new creation, he's making new men and women first, and the new heaven and the earth last. Why is he doing it in reverse order? Because he wants you in his new creation, that's why. And he wants to make you ready and fit for that new creation. That's why he's going to save you from all your sins. That's why he redeems us. He's getting us ready for the new world. But he's making us first. And you know, more men and women are made new people on a Sunday than any other day of the week. And God the Creator is making new people. That's why it says, if any man is in Christ, that is the new creation. And it began when he gave a new body to his son. The resurrection, therefore, is the beginning of the new creation. And it will only end when God says, Behold, I make everything new. That's on the last page almost of the Bible. And then he will make nature new. Planet Earth and everything in space will be made new because this is a dying planet. It will die and rise again as Jesus died and rose again. So that we're beginning to get a much bigger picture of the resurrection. It's not just Jesus coming back to life. It's Jesus, the beginning of the new creation, the firstborn of all creation, the first person ever to get that new body. Nobody else has got it yet. But one day new men and women will get new bodies and I'm going to get a new body. But I've jumped ahead to the last point I want to make. The point I'm making now is that the essence of creation is that God created a new body for Jesus. And that was the first new thing that God had created since he finished the work of creation in Genesis. Now let's look at the consequence, no, the experience first. I'll deal with this very briefly. The experience of the resurrection means that because Christ is alive, we can have a relationship with him that is experiential. We can know that we've been talking to him. We can know that he's replied. We can know him personally. That's the essence of what a Christian is. If you don't know Jesus personally, you're not a Christian yet. It's a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with the risen, ascended Jesus. And though he's up in heaven at the right hand of the Father, I can talk to him every day. And it's a real experience. He can heal you, as he did in the days when he was on earth. We can have a personal relationship. We can't see him because he's out of sight in heaven. We will see him, but we can't see him at the moment, but we can talk to him. We can experience his presence. And uh, he, he's able to do that through the Holy Spirit given to us. For the Holy Spirit is, as a child put it, Jesus' other self. It's the Spirit of Jesus who comes and dwells in our hearts and we experience the Spirit of Jesus. And we know, we know Jesus personally and what an experience that is. I used to sing a chorus which I can't remember, but it had a line in it, he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Does anybody know the first line of that? He lives. Oh, sorry. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That's the last line. But in between, he walks with me and talks with me 
a long life's narrow way. Once you know Jesus, you can sing a chorus like that. You just know he's risen. You don't need persuading. And anybody can have that experience if they will talk to him, trust him, obey him. They will find that he's really alive. Years ago I was preaching near Cambridge in England and there was a Jewess in the congregation. She was about 25, good-looking Jewess. And she came to me afterwards. She said, David, are you trying to tell me that Jesus of Nazareth is still alive? I said, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. And she said, well, if he is, he must be our Messiah. Notice the word our. And I said, that's right. She said, how can I find out if he's alive? I said, come with me into the room at the back. And I left her there. I said, I'm leaving you here for 15 minutes or 10 minutes, may have been, I forget which. And I said, just talk to him. Because if he's alive, he'll talk to you. Talk to him. Tell him about yourself. Tell him what you as a Jew think about him as the Messiah. Even if you think he's not the Messiah, you just tell him. Just talk with him. And I'll come back. I went back in about ten minutes. And she said, he's alive, he's alive. And she was now experiencing the resurrection. And then within five minutes, she's teaching me the Bible. I thought I knew it until she started. But she knew the scriptures, the Old Testament, back to front. And she said, then this is true, and this is true, and this is true. And she took me through the Old Testament, proving that Jesus was alive and was her Messiah. It was a very exciting moment. She'd entered into the experience of the resurrection. Finally tonight, let's look at the consequence of the resurrection of Jesus for ourselves, even for our whole world. The first consequence is that we will also be resurrected. Human existence is in three phases. Phase number one, this life, when we are an embodied spirit. I'm an embodied spirit, so are you. I'm not very happy when someone says, I'll be with you in spirit on Wednesday evening. I prefer preaching to people who are embodied spirits. <laughs> and people who just will be with me in spirit, it's no fun preaching to them. We are embodied spirits. I'm an embodied spirit. I can preach to you because I'm embodied. You can listen because you're an embodied spirit. But the real you is spirit. I'm not just preaching to bodies. I'm preaching to your spirit. And your spirit is embodied. That's phase one. At death, spirit and body are separated. And the body is either cremated or buried and the spirit goes on, but not here. We go on with the dead, with disembodied spirits. Now Paul was a realist. He had a bit of a battle in himself. At times he didn't want to be a disembodied spirit. He said, I, I'm sure I'll feel undressed. I'll feel unclothed. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in which he expresses the doubt. And he said, I'd rather be in the body, I think. And then he overcomes that doubt. And he says, no, I'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He said, that's far better than here. And so he got to the point where he said, I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better once you know Christ, even a disembodied existence with Christ, in which you can communicate directly with him, and he with you, and you will be with those who have loved and lost, but who you have lost in Christ, you will be with them. I look forward to being with my daughter. I look forward to being with my sisters 
one of whom died at 36, like my daughter. I look forward to being with my father and mother and my grandfather and grandmother, both sides. I'm going to be with those who are in Christ and above all with Christ himself. And we shall be able to communicate again with each other, spirit to spirit. And that's far better than here to the Christian. It's not to anyone else, but to the Christian, that's far better than being here in a body. However, that's not the future. That's a temporary lodging. We only go to heaven as spirits, and we're only there temporarily. When Jesus comes back to earth, we who love him will come back with him. And it's at that point that we become re-embodied with a new body created by God, a body that will never grow old or tired or weary or diseased, but a body that will serve us forever. And that body will be like his glorious body, and therefore I assume it will be 33 years old, because he hasn't had a birthday since he ascended to heaven. He's still 33 years old. And for an 80-year-old like me to look forward to having a 33-year-old body, hallelujah, <laughs> it's going to be great. That's when I was at my peak, physically, mentally. It's been downhill all the way ever since. And here I am, 80, and I'm going to be 33 again. Isn't that exciting? I'm trying to be utterly realistic about this. Because the Bible is realistic. And then the fullest possible life will be mine, with a body again, and able to live on the new earth with the Lord. Do you know that God is moving house at the end of history? At the moment he lives up in heaven, but at the end of history he's moving down to earth. And we won't say our Father which art in heaven ever again. We'll say our Father who art with us on earth. That will be our prayer to him. He's coming to live with us. And on the last page of the Bible, even the angels are utterly surprised. Look, they say, behold! And behold, it's uh, if you're from Wales, it's, look you, it, it's a, an expression of astonishment. Behold, look, the dwelling place of God is with men. He's finally going to join us on earth, in the new earth. I'm just excited about that. That's the Bible. You're looking forward to living with God on the new earth, in a city where there are no church buildings, hallelujah. No cathedrals, no temples. When you're living with God, who needs a church building? And so there's no temple there. But God will be there. And his son. And his spirit. And we shall be living with all three. It even says, we shall see God's face. And nobody has ever seen God's face. Moses wanted to see his face, but he saw, he saw his back, not his face. Saw God pass by. But one day we'll actually see God's face. Don't ask me how. I've got a big box at home called Wait and See. <laughs> and all my curiosity questions, which aren't answered in the Bible, go into the box. Wait and see. And I'm quite happy to wait and see. We're not to become obsessed with the future, but to get ready for it. And all our questions will one day be answered because God knows us and we shall know him as well as he knows us then. And he knows how many hairs on my head. He knows they're getting fewer, but nevertheless he knows. He knows every detail of me. To put it in up-to-date language, God has memorized my DNA so he can produce a physical body again without needing any of this body because he's got the DNA in his mind and he can produce a body like this one 
that will last forever. And I so look forward to that. That's the consequence for me and for you. But I have to add that according to the Bible, everybody on earth will get a new immortal body. For the Bible makes it quite plain that the resurrection will occur for everybody. Whatever life they've lived, they will get a new body that will last forever. That's quite plain in the book of Daniel, in the Gospel of John, and the book of Acts. Let me read them. Daniel 12 says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust will awake, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus said, don't be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the Son of Man's voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And Paul said at his trial before Felix, I have the same hope in God that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So everybody is going to be resurrected. Adolf Hitler will be resurrected and get an immortal body. Napoleon will. The world's dictators, Stalin, all of them will get new bodies. But that's not the issue. Everybody will rise from the dead and get a new immortal body that will last them forever. But the next thing I must add is that there will be two days of resurrection separated by a millennium. In the first resurrection, which we all hope to share, I trust, is the resurrection of the righteous. It's called in your New Testament the resurrection out from among the dead. So at the first resurrection, blessed and holy are those who share in that resurrection, who get their new bodies before the others. So there will be two resurrection days, separated in time, and the rest of mankind will get their resurrection later. We will get our re resurrection, as I explained this morning, when Jesus comes back to planet Earth. And that's when we will get our new bodies and we'll need them because we're back on Earth. And he is back on Earth with his body. And we shall have new bodies to reign over the nations with him. Many more questions will be in your minds now, but I can't answer them now. So everybody gets a new body, but not at the same time. There will be two resurrections Jesus taught, the first and the second. The resurrection of the righteous and then the rest. And finally, the big question of all, and with this I finish. We shall all get resurrection bodies, not at the same time, but at two separate times. And above all, not to live in the same place. And I can think of nothing worse to happen to anyone than to get a body that will last forever and find they're in the wrong place. That's a horrific thought. They'll either be in the new earth with the Lord or in hell without the Lord. And to know that you're going to live forever, can't even commit suicide, you're here forever. And hell is a physical place for physical bodies, for those resurrection bodies of those who have lived here without God. And it's a physical place because Jesus said there will be tears there. And there will be teeth there because there will be gnashing of teeth. And tears and gnashing of teeth spell for me utter frustration. You gnash your teeth when you're frustrated. And hell is everlasting frustration. To know that your body will go on forever and you will never have the opportunity to change location. That's hell. 
That is why all we know about hell we learn from Jesus' lips himself. Only he spoke about it. And he spoke about it with such horror. In language he said it's better for you to lose an eye or a foot or a hand than enter into life and find yourself living in hell. I finish there and I urge everyone who has listened to me to make sure that you, your new body will be in the right place because you are going to live forever. Jesus' resurrection tells you that. But he wants you to live in the new heaven and the new earth where he has made everything new for you. And he wants to live with you. And he wants you to have the same address as he has. And he had died and went through hell on the cross so that you might never finish up there. I can only plead with you. Get to know the risen Jesus now while you can. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And make sure that your resurrection body will live in the right place with the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that what I've just said may be really planted deep within our hearts so that everyone here may look forward to living with you. Lord, it's just wonderful news that we can be reunited with a body here on earth, a new body that will never let us down again. And I look forward to that. But Lord, I'm so concerned that anyone here should not find themselves living forever with tears and gnashing of teeth and darkness and thirst. I pray, Lord, that that may not happen to anyone here. Don't let them have rest until they've settled things with you and known your forgiveness and your holiness, free gifts of your grace to us all. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the glory. It belongs to you alone for thinking up such an amazing answer to our problems, such a wonderful redemption of the whole of us, body, mind, and soul, made new for you. So Lord, take my words and plant them deeply in every heart. And I ask it for your name's sake. Amen. If you are determined in your mind and heart to get right with God, would you please just tell me? I'll shake hands with all of you, God willing, as you leave tonight. Just tell me if tonight God has spoken to you and asked you to settle it with him for because that's what he wanted. You can tell me as you leave. We're all now going to sing, crown him with many crowns. And one verse is all about the resurrection. I'll tell you a secret. We had difficulty finding a song about the resurrection. I've known that with every music group in church. That's because we can easily find songs about the cross and his death for us. But the center of my faith is the resurrection. And we found a song that includes the resurrection. So let's stand and sing, crown him with many crowns.